we're about ready to start our afternoon panels. And the panel three is what can be done. And we have um, the title uh, of this next one is what resources are needed versus what resources are available. We have North Shore Community College Distinguished Alumni Award recipient Peggy Andres, nursing of 85. Uh, our second panel member is senior academic counselor um, Donna Davis and senior academic counselor Debbie Campbell. Welcome all of you. So each one will speak and then we'll do question and answer after. Good afternoon. So yes, my name is Peggy Andreas. I'm a nurse with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. I've been with this agency for the past five years and it's a very unique position that I was hired for uh, called the family team. And what the family team does is we go into motels in the greater Boston area to deliver medical services to homeless families. Um, a little bit of background. When I first graduated from North Shore Community College as a young nurse, I was aware of homeless men. That was probably just post the Vietnam War era. Um, soon thereafter, I became aware of homeless women, and I found that shocking. How could we as a society have women who are homeless out on the streets? But that was a reality, and places like Pine Street and Rosie's Place developed shelters to house women. And now, in this day and age, we have entire families that are homeless. Depending on the month, in the greater Boston area, we have between 1,900 and 2,100 homeless families. That's not individuals. It could be a family of four or five. When I was sitting in the back and looking up here at the screen, it, that's approximately the size of a motel room. So to have an entire family housed in a space that size with perhaps only a small college dorm refrigerator and maybe a microwave in order to feed an entire family um, is appalling to me as a medical provider. And then to be able to come out and speak to those families about how to feed a family, um, how to encourage exercise in children so that they're not dealing with problems of obesity. Uh, essentially just to share with you how daunting of a challenge it is on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm part of a team. I travel with a case manager who is bilingual. Um, I pretty much go to seven or eight motels in the course of a week and occasionally some shelters, including a DV shelter. And we're the first line, knocking on doors, checking in on these families to make sure everyone is well and safe, determine what their needs are, what do they need help uh, making a connection with, and the needs are very vast and numerous. I wear a lot of different hats in the course of my day. Um, I never know when I open a door whether I'm going to be confronted with um, substance abuse, um, domestic violence behind those closed doors, uh, children with horrific medical problems needing to be connected to perhaps a primary care or a pediatrician or a hospital. Um, when I describe my job to my family and friends, I like to say a good day is a day when the door opens and a toddler runs over and grabs me by the leg to give me a hug because I may be the only visitor they see in the course of the day or the week. Or when I get to hold a newborn, which happened yesterday, I was able to hold a newborn that was born just on October 14th. That's a good day. A not good day, in my perspective, is a day when I'm calling 911, or I'm administering an antidote because someone has overdosed, or unfortunately having to file um, on a family uh, because I'm concerned about uh, neglect or abuse of a child as a mandated reporter. So that's not a good day. And pretty much every other day has a little bit of both uh, interspersed. In terms of services and resources, um, I wear, a, a, as I said, a lot of different hats because families have a lot of questions and they don't know where to go. Um, I don't always know the answer. Uh, it depends on the community that I'm serving. So I visit motels all the way up to Waltham, down to Brockton. 
So I need to quickly become an expert about the resources in those communities so that I can help families um, become connected. Um, the challenges uh, are many. A family may be brand new to that area. The mom, if she's head of the household, maybe isn't literate. Maybe English isn't her first language. So I am puzzled trying to navigate our very complicated social system. How can that individual navigate the system? Um, so we try to help in any way that we can. Um, we're trying to help families become connected with mass health so they have medical insurance. We want to make sure they have primary care providers. Um, I want to be able to make an appointment for them if someone has a dental emergency. Um, it's, not, it's not simple for you or I to manage some of those problems, but even um, tenfold of a challenge for a family that's homeless. Um, the agency that I work for is pretty amazing, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. It serves the greater Boston area. Um, they have a number of services right uh, within their clinic settings. Everything from a respite unit for families coming in off the street to a dental clinic, a pharmacy, um, as well as the services that the family team provides. Um, you know, there's a lot that I could share with you if time allowed about what the challenges are for families and the types of connections that we try to make in the course of every single challenging day. But I'm going to wrap it up and pass uh, the mic along so you can hear from uh, folks that can speak specifically to the student population and the challenges that they face. It will be available for questions afterwards. And let me just also mention that Boston Healthcare has a table in the back. And if you have an opportunity, stop by and chat with Allison, uh, who's here to represent my um, agency and could talk to you a little bit more about the services that we provide. Thank you, Peggy. My name is Debbie Campbell, and I am one of the academic counselor slash mental health counselor here. Um, Donna is my counterpart on Danvers, and I'm situated here in Lynn. My background involves working within the community, um, Lynn community, Revere community, Chelsea community, but I'm just gonna speak directly to my current position here and the students that I have um, come across who, or who have actually come into my office. And since we have started um, tracking the, the concerns that have come across the students' needs, in Lynn, the, one of the top five is actually homeless and financial concerns of students. I have come across students, students have been in my office who are in their cars and coming to class. Um, many are in shelters. Uh, there are those who are, those who are in the process of being evicted or actually already evicted from their homes and they're still coming to class. Um, so those are just some of the, the, the type of um, situations that surround um, our students as far as the homelessness financial concerns um, related. Now, Many, as I said, many are res residing in shelters and we do our best, well I do my best to connect them or um, try to see if there's any possible way to, to get that need, that basic need, shelter need met. My job limitations does not allow me to go out there and travel with them and, you know, fill out applications, different things like that. But in terms of having all the, the, the resources at, at, my, at, at, at my, my availability, we have a community resource manual, which I'm so grateful for. There is, there's an agency, um, the Children's Law Center, that actually put together a whole bunch of resources. And that, I think, is one of the things that we actually need at working you know, in, in this capacity. We need a more comprehensive list, I think, um, in my, as I said, my background working within the community, I have some ideas of some of the, the services that I can refer students to, but since I came here, I found some more. 
But at the same time, it makes me realize that we are so disjointed, I think, in our communication when it comes to services. And I, that's one of the challenges that I, I face. And then knowing that um, the shelters, when, when you give the information on shelters, shelters are not necessarily in Lynn. And then the students don't have transportation. Some are in Salem. Some are referring me to Boston, and I'm there advocating and saying, no, they live in Lynn, and they go to school in Lynn. They go to college in Lynn. So it's, you know, it's just a tough, tough situation in, in, in that sense for them. Um, now, homelessness also involves the, the students coming in not having finances um, to purchase meals. Um, think we do have the shock voucher. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, the shock voucher. Um, shock vouchers, they're like coupons, $7 coupons that the college actually has funded for students who really don't have a way of getting meals throughout the day. And it's really, it's, it's really limited to severe you know, financial concerns and homelessness. And really, we, it's not a program, but we can give those out. Um, honestly, it's limited to maybe once or twice um, per student. I would say mainly once because of the vast need that we have. I mean, it's not enough to do a lot, but it's still something that we can do. All right, and that's what we have been doing. And we are the point of contacts for those um, situations. But we do have some, um, we have My Brother's Table, and that's actually one of the agencies that's closer to this college, because remember, some of our students don't have means and ways of transportation. Um, but my brother's table is actually in walking distance, so I have also been referring students to my brother's table for meals. You know, they have meals, I think, in the afternoon and also in the evenings. But these are just some of the, the many, many um, challenges, as I said, that I'm facing um, in terms of providing the resources that's needed for them to, to study, to come to school and be be able to be stress-free in that area because it's very hard to study and to come to classes when, you, when you're, you're hungry and when you don't have a roof over your head. And it's, it just breaks my heart in a, in a lot of ways. I just, my thing is I just want a comprehensive list. It would be great to have a, that comprehensive list so that I'm able to, to navigate properly and just advocate for, for, for the students in that sense. Thank you very much. So my name is Donna Davis. I'm also a counselor here, as Debbie had mentioned, and I do the same type of work that Debbie does. And so what happens when a student that um, here at North Shore Community College um, comes to our office and tells us that they're homeless or they're in the midst of being homeless, um, they immediately want resources. And what all I can do right now is kind of go on the web and try to search out possibilities for them that way. But as Debbie and Peggy have already mentioned, they are disjointed resources. I would love one place that I could go to find a step-by-step -step type of uh, situation that students should consider. Um, what we're told right now is that we should have students um, go to the Department of Transitional Assistance and register that way. And in order to do that, they have to um, be um, eligible as homeless, or what, which means essentially spending a night in a shelter. And so you can't go there if you're planning on being evicted, you know, knowing that that's coming up. You can't go there if you've just been kicked out of the house and you're possibly staying with friends for a while. Um, you have to be literally living on the street. And that's very frustrating to students, especially our single moms that have children. They don't want to bring their children to a shelter. And unfortunately, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, not urban legends, some of them are true, but, you know, that kind of feeling that people have about shelters, that they're not going to be a safe place for their children. And so we have students that also can't get to the Department of Transitional Assistance because they don't have transportation to get there. So those are kind of the immediate things that we run up against and we're, we're seeking out something that we can do in the interim to help them. Is there someplace locally that we can send them? I know there's several organizations that are here 
you know, which are wonderful, but for counselors or social workers that you know, really need to have the comprehensive list, that's what we're looking for in the community. So that we don't necessarily have to have them be living on the street, we'd like to have a plan that they can do in the interim before they get to that point. Um, and that's what families want. They know I'm going to be evicted in 30 days, I don't have any more money that I can't pay my rent, what can I do? And I have to look at them and say, the state can't help you until you're literally living on the street. And what counselor or social worker wants to say that to a family? That sounds absurd. And then we, you know, we often tell them that if you can spend your time with family or friends and, and try to reestablish some, some employment and we help them with those goals, that's going to be better for you than actually going through the system that exists. And that's, again, not helpful to a family. You know, it's great that they have friends, but that's not what they should be having to do when our, our, you know, our state should be providing more. So that's kind of where we're at, and it's a frustration that we have when students come in because we want to do more for them. We want them to, who are able to plan ahead. Think about it. I have 60 days until I'm going to be kicked out of my home. I need to figure out what I do next, and I have to tell them, well, you have to wait through that 60 days, and as soon as you're on the street, then let me know. And that's a horrible thing, and, and that's what we're trying to kind of uh, you know, work around, and those are the resources that we really need. Just, just in, in addition to, to what Donna just says, um, even though there are some resources here, I think inland, there are some resources available. And I do have wind of some of those. But um, what I also run into is that the systems are actually overly exhausted. There is, there is this huge waiting list. I remember working with Section 8 before when um, it, there's, a, there's a single mom with children, that usually take priority and the process can be expedited. Now that's out of the question. I mean, it's like a four to seven wait for even housing. Um, so it's, even if the resources are indeed there and we do have some of, some of those to, you know, at, at, you know, that are available to us, they are just so, so overly exhausted and there's just this huge wait list, and then what do we do with our students in that time? So I think at this time we're probably opening up for questions and, you know, from, from the audience. Or suggestions. Or suggestions. <laughs> Susan? Yeah. Hi, I'm from my brother's table, and I just wanted to back up. Students are great. They're welcome. Everybody's welcome. Don't need an ID. Just come in. We serve about 150 lunches a day and 200 uh, suppers a night. Uh, seven days a week. No, no ID, anything. Just come in, have a meal, and, and feed yourself. And they can do that seven days a week. And thank you, thank you very much. It's easy Welcome. for them because so many of these places don't. You have to have the ID, you have to register, and so forth. And that becomes very complicated. No, and they're all treated with respect. And please be our guest, all of you. Thank Just you. Come for dinner. Yes. Thank you very much. On an encouraging note, um, because talking about a subject like this can be very disheartening, there are a lot of really good agencies that are out in communities doing a tremendous job to try to fill the gaps uh, that we are struggling with as a society. Massachusetts happens to be one of the states that really does a remarkable job, um, sometimes too much so. Um, because that can be a drain on taxpayers. But I'm really proud to work for and within agencies that truly put their time and effort uh, behind their mission statement. Um, in terms of solutions, one of the small things, and this was through a grant uh, that someone wrote for a while back, to help solve the transportation problem, which can be huge. Imagine a pregnant mom, maybe with a toddler, needing to get from a shelter location to her prenatal appointment. So uh, one of the solutions our agency offers is um, bus passes. Charlie cards is something that we carry and we hand out to um, individuals that can demonstrate that they you know, have an appointment and a need um, so that they can actually get to um, some of the resources that are available in communities. And on the flip side of that, we're also encouraging more services to come to the shelters. Instead of trying to insist that um, an individual trek into Boston, go to DTA, go to MBHP, or whatever, um, you know, a food pantry, we're trying to bring those services 
to, into the um, shelter locations. And a lot of um, agencies have responded to that request. And that's just one little step that has made life uh, quite a bit easier for homeless families. And in addition to, to what Peggy just um, mentioned, as far as the solutions, and you know, feel free to come up afterwards and ask questions. Um, in, as, far as far as Lynn is concerned and, and sending students or giving them referrals, there are pantries I know that are indeed available. We have um, pantries, St. Mary's Parish, that um, right there at um, Common Street, and they have, um, they distribute pastries, they distribute food items that, um, free food it items for college students. And believe me, I, I was a college student. I utilized food pantries when I was in college. We don't have money anyways. So um, I usually tell, you know, give students that type of referral. Um, and also City Mission um, behind the East Coast International Church, they also do have distribution out in, on Saturday mornings. The, the issue with that, especially with the um, homeless, is that we do come across where um, they, there's a certain criteria and eligibility process that sometimes, you know, for homeless um, folks, it's very difficult for them to be eligible for certain services. I know for the food pantries here listed, some do need verification, um, maybe a utility bill. Of course, we know that a homeless person probably wouldn't have that information. Maybe the school, the school ID, though, they're saying that can also suffice. Um, those are some of the things that um, some of these agencies would require to, for, for them to receive help in, in, the, in, in, the, in the case of having meals. And we do have on our website, um, for, for students here, we do have on our website um, for the Student Support and Advising Center through which Donna and I work, we have the emergency resources webpage, and on there we have a listing of various um, areas and categories, and on there we do have a listing of um, local food pantries. And one of the main, main source that we have too is the Project Bread's for, food source hotline. I don't know how many of you are aware of this particular resource, but it's a 1-800 number and they can actually help a lot of college students. In fact, they will also help with the S SNAP SNAP, um, food stamps, they also said, um, able to, to, I guess, help the students get through that process of being eligible for food stamps. So that's also a main source for students. Um, let's see, I know, with DTA was mentioned, but there's also that eligibility processing um, that sometimes our students or sometimes people that we work with are not able to be qualified for. All right, but our food, the food source hotline is, is one of the main, main ones. And I'll give you that number if you're writing. It's 1-800-645-8333. And it's called the Project Bread Food Source Hotline. Mainly what they do too is just they see what area you're in and then they would give you the, the, um, the, the local food pantries or just other resources for the area, the zip code area that you're in. Okay. We just have maybe one minute. If, I don't know if there's one small question from the audience. Um, just because there's a lot of students here, I thought I'd mention this, that a lot of people think that it uh, takes a lot of financial resources um, to help people that are hungry or people that are homeless. But one thing that can, a lot of students can do is um, they can take part in activities, like I just heard Project Bread mentioned, and the Walk for Hunger happens every year in Boston. It's a 20-mile walk, and a lot of students are in really good shape, and that's yet another way um, to help contribute. Thank you very much. And to piggyback off of that, my brother's table is also this Sunday doing their annual walk. They've been doing it for many, many years. I can't remember how, how many, but I'm actually going to be volunteering there on Sunday as a greeter. Um, so um, they start at um, the, um, the church in Swampscott. I can't remember the name. And they'll be walking along um, uh, the, uh, the 
Swamp Scott to the Lynn Way, I believe, somewhere like that. So that's also a good um, fundraiser and to help out too for students. Hi, um, I work with LGBT youth and I want to ask, are there any resources that we can access for youth under the age of 18? Sorry, that's not, unfortunately, that's not our area of expertise because we work with college age students traditionally. I know there's a, there's a hotline that's on our emergency resources website that um, I could direct you to, and that's supposed to have a lot of resources for all ages, okay. but having, um, I don't unfortunately have direct experience with that. Okay. But I'll, I can tell you afterwards if you'd like. Okay, thank okay. you. And just to, just an additional note on that, and I do have from the manual, there's a, as I said, there is a list that was compiled by the Children's Law Center, and they do have an area for um, LGBT resources also. So um, anyone? A student can definitely touch base with with us on on that piece also and I must say too that the the data there is a I get to understand as far as resources for under 18 there is a little bit more resources I get to understand for under 18 but what I'm finding out because I'm my population has changed I was working with kids and because it's kids and families, minors and, and adults, it was a little bit better. But now I'm working with college age adults, we're finding out that there is not a lot of resources for adult age, um, the adult age group. That's what I'm finding out. And um, actually, I was speaking with someone who's actually trying to get some data collected so that it could be part of the process to, to obtain some resources um, that we can, we can get get that in for that age group. Um, for under, under 18, if they're in a school, very often the high schools in the guidance department will have a homeless liaison or on the district level. So for families with school-age children, very often starting at your school with a guidance counselor, social worker, adjustment counselor would probably be a good first step and then be guided to resources from there. Thank you very much. Because I've also worked with agencies who will work with families and they will also tackle homelessness if that family is, is um, in, in that area. But their category is from zero to, to 21. So, I mean, it's, it's, it just varies. And, but thank you very much for that as far as where the school is concerned. So thank you very much, ladies. Is this on? Um, so we're gonna go on to the next panel. So our last panel is Legislating for Social Justice. We have the Director of Citizens for Adequate Housing, Corey Jackson, and Director of Legislative Advocacy at Mass Coalition for the Homeless, Kelly Turley. Thank you both. Hello, everybody. I'm Corey Jackson, the Executive Director of Citizens for Adequate Housing. Uh, we're based in Peabody, but serve families from all over the North Shore. Um, we do have two shelters, the in-between and in-transition uh, that um, house 29 families, 53 kids. And we work with another 70 families that are in permanent housing to keep them housed as our prevention work. So last year we touched about 130 families in this way and um, we're constantly um, working with our legislators and our community leaders and it's great to see some people here um, to really echo um, everything that we need done on the legislative side. Um, I, I did want to say uh, Kelly's organization, Mass Coalition for the Homeless, and um, another organization called Homes for Families, uh, run by Libby Hayes, are instrumental in our understanding of the legislative process. And I think that's something uh, to really pay attention to. Those two organizations on Facebook, on Twitter, on their own pers uh, their websites, um, they keep you really informed on what's going on at the State House, and that is so key. It's so complicated, it's so difficult to understand, especially during budget season. Uh, it's going so fast, there are amendments, there are all these uh, crazy things that none of us would ever hope to understand by reading through everything. Um, and they make it so easy to understand, and easy to understand what we need to be fighting for. Um, so I, w I would encourage you all to like them on Facebook, if you have a Facebook. 
uh, profile and, and pay attention, because it's not just during budget season. Um, we were just talking before, uh, before this started about a bill that um, is in front of um, the Senate, House, Ways and Means Committee right now uh, on youth homelessness, and I'm sure Kelly will talk about that a little bit. But now that I know about it, I can echo Kelly's voice and, and others' voices uh, to our legislators, both where I work in Peabody and where I live here in Lynn. I'll be talking to our reps and our, um, our senators about this important problem. And the more of us that do that, the more voters that do that, uh, the more they hear it, the more likely we are to get something done at the state level and at the system-wide level. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly now. Thank you, Corey. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm really um, pleased also to be joined by my colleague, Sister Linda Bessem, who is in the back at the resource table for the Mass Coalition for the Homeless. <laughs> and um, the coalition does a lot of work on the public policy side, but we also do direct service work. We're located around the corner, um, right on the Linway, and we run a furniture bank for families and individuals who are exiting homelessness and moving into housing. We have a partnership with the Lynn Public Schools to work with families who may be at risk of homelessness to try to help them with housing applications, get them connected to public benefits, do tenant landlord mediation. Uh, we also do a similar program in collaboration with early intervention programs here on the North Shore and work with families and individuals who have chronic respiratory illnesses and help them um, redo their apartments to decrease the triggers. We know that one of the causes of homelessness, there's so many, but is um, families not being able to maintain a job because of health issues and children not being able to go to school because of health issues and falling behind. So trying to um, help low-income families and individuals address those needs. Um, we also do a lot of mobilization with faith communities and community groups and um, schools to be able to raise awareness about homelessness and I think events like today are really critical to have so many people focused on the issues and raising up their voices and to share that with the broader community. Um, my job at the coalition is to oversee our public policy work um, and as Corey alluded to, it's not always that fun or uh, sexy kind of having to go through reams and reams of documents, sit through hours of watching paint dry at the state house, waiting for that one moment you'll have the chance to talk to a legislator like Speaker DeLeo, or to be able to um, insert your voice into the conversation. But outside of actually being at the state house, there's so much that needs to be done and can be done. Um, talking to legislators, both at the state level, at the local level, um, and at the national level. Um, because we know that in order for homelessness to really be addressed, that we need to have interventions, we need to have resources. Um, at the coalition, we don't look to the individual or a family as being the cause of their own homelessness. We know that there are systems that have, have failed and that there's resources that need to be um, brought to bear. So for example, in Massachusetts, even though it's a very rich state and there is an unprecedented level of investment in affordable housing and homelessness prevention resources, they're nowhere to scale. Um, and everyone in this room un understands that. But there's a sense at the State House that we've, tr we've put a lot of resources in, so why haven't we solved the problem? Well, we haven't solved the problem because we're not getting to the root issues. So, for example, um, several years ago, there was a special commission to look at homelessness issues. And one of the co-chairs of the commission said, we're here to solve homelessness. We're not here to address poverty. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, we're gonna be really successful. So unfortunately, there was a five-year plan to end homelessness that didn't address ending poverty and you know we're at year six and a half and obviously homelessness is a bigger problem more than ever. Last night there were 1,851 families staying in motels and hotels across the state because all of the over 2,000 shelter rooms for families were full. Over 3,000 individuals um, were staying overnight in shelter. Hundreds more were staying in domestic violence shelters. 50% of the families that apply for shelter each month are turned away because they don't meet the strict eligibility guidelines. There are only 12 shelter rooms for unaccompanied youth in all of greater Boston. 
We know that the problem is enormous. We're just getting to hit the, the surface of it. But in order to do that, we need to continue to put pressure on the legislature to make these key investments, not just in housing and homelessness issues, but in the related issues that we've talked about um, throughout the day, making investments in education, in healthcare, in training, um, in domestic violence support, substance abuse treatment programs, mental health programs, medical care, child care, and really looking at these issues as an issue of human rights, putting it in that context. Um, but as advocates, we're often um, come to the table and we complain. We say that we need more. We're grateful, but we need this. Um, but we, it's also important for us to take stock in the victories that we have had and the impact that we've been able to make. Um, with people around the state like you who've raised up their voices and maybe it's just a fraction of their time, maybe just a few minutes a month spent reaching out to legislators, we were able to get the legislature to make historic reinvestments in a program that Speaker DeLeo um, mentioned earlier, the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program. Um, this year, the program has direct funding of $65 million with another $5.5 million carried over from last year. And with those new resources, about 1,500 families and individuals will be able to get new housing subsidies in this fiscal year, um, which is amazing. It's a small amount considering the large scale of homelessness, but to see the state begin to reinvest where we need to has been really important. Um, and on that note, applications for some of these new housing subsidies um, have been made available by the Department of Housing and Community Development and they're taking applications for a few more weeks. So if you're working with any families or individuals, we really encourage them to get on the waiting list because the program um, was underfunded for so long that they weren't even maintaining a waiting list in some parts of the state. So I encourage people to apply for that. Um, we also saw the legislature made historic investments in the RAFT program, which is a homelessness prevention program for families residential assistance for families in transition. And here in Lynn, it's administered by the Lynn Housing Authority. Um, so we know that we need to, in order to end homelessness, we need to get at the roots of it and help people avoid even entering into homelessness. So this is a key program that helps people pay for back rent, back utility bills, um, and to get to the, before the point where they're actually lost their housing. So we know that $11 million doesn't meet the full need of everyone across the state, but it's an important step in the right direction. But we know that there's more work to be done. So um, earlier we talked about House Bill 135. Those of you, how many people saw the film last night with um, No Place Like Home with the filmmaker Neil? Um, so in that film around youth homelessness, um, part of it talks about a piece of legislation and act to provide housing and support services to unaccompanied youth. Um, Glenda and others talked about the needs of young people in the state who are without housing. We see that there's a huge increase in young people under the age of 24 who aren't with a parent or guardian. Maybe they're in high school, maybe they're in college, um, but don't have the resources to be able to afford housing. And we see that this is a population that the state hasn't begun to really make statewide investments in. And so this bill would call on the state to invest in long-term housing, emergency housing, and wraparound services for young people. And um, we're grateful that the speaker mentioned that he would keep looking at the bill, but we're hopeful that it will pass the session. But in order for that to happen, there's only 70 days left to the session, that we need to keep the pressure on legislators. So we invite people to take action, um, to reach out to your state senator, your state representative, to let them know that you care about housing and homelessness issues in general, but in particular around this bill. Um, there's not too much left on their agenda to do before the end of the session on December 31st. They've basically finished most of their important business as they see it um, by July 31st. But this is a piece of legislation that's still under consideration. And um, we know that without taking action now, any bill to pass will likely be another two years because they work in a two-year cycle and they generally wait to the last minute like some of us um, do for projects. But there, So it would be another two years and we have a campaign, Youth Without Homes Can't Wait. And so we invite you to be part of that um, by writing to your legislator a letter um, by taking an online action. We have a letter that's already written up and you just put your name and email address and your address and it will, the, our system knows who your legislators are. We'll send you a copy, we'll send your legislators a copy um, and that's available at mahomeless.org. If you're willing to write a letter to the editor 
legislators read their local papers. They want to know what you're thinking and let others in your community know that what you care about. Um, so we have templates of letters that you can send to letters um, to your local papers and the contact information for um, local papers as well. Um, if you're able to come to the State House, we are more than happy to set up meetings for you with your legislators, either at the State House in Boston or in the district. Um, legislators usually have office hours, often on Fridays, in their district. And it's really powerful for them to hear people in their community, whether or not you've been directly impacted by homelessness, to know that you care about it. Um, but especially if you've struggled with housing instability or homelessness, to let them know what your experience has been, what have been your struggles, what have helped you exit homelessness, what are the resources that you need. Legislators and aides really do listen, and you can see the light go off when people share their real life experiences, and that's what's critical. Um, Speaker DeLeo mentioned funding resources for unaccompanied youth in the state budget. We had a conversation with him where there were young people sharing their story, and he um, really sat back and was like, I didn't know that that was happening to young people. And he talked to the House Ways and Means Committee, and that was really key in getting, even though it's a small amount of money, into the state budget. So we know that these real-life conversations with real-life people, um, those of you in the audience, do make an impact. So we encourage you to stay connected. Um, Corey mentioned that we have email lists, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, phone conversations, calling us, asking us to come um, meet with you in your community. Um, it's so key that all together, that's the only way we're going to make change at the state level. So we're appreciative of your presence here and want to stay in touch. Sister Linda, I think, has an email list sign up. Um, but if you're interested in staying in touch, share your information. Um, we'd love to work with you more and hear more about what you're seeing. I mean, we're here in Lynn and, and doing a lot of work on the North Shore, but also statewide. But if there are particular issues in the community, um, we'd love to talk to you more but see what's going on because our staff is, is very small, but we're, as a group, um, with our members, we try to have a really big presence. So um, thank you for um, listening and look forward to working with you more going forward. Anybody has any questions? So while we're waiting for a question, um, it, she mentioned the MRVP line item at 65 million. In 1992, I believe, it was double that. So if we really think about that and we think about how expensive housing has become over those decades, it doesn't make any sense. And I, a lot of our legislators do understand that, and that's why the amount went up so much um, in this year's budget. But it has to go up so much more. Um, that's something we fight for regularly and something we all need to be uh, a little more aware of. There's also, there's been a few numbers thrown around about families um, that are homeless. Um, so I think the first number was between 1,800 and 2,100 in the motel population. That's correct on a, on a daily basis. Um, the, the shelter system, system recently expanded from their 2,000 number to 2,750. Um, so, so right now, today, there are almost 5,000 families living in either a motel room or a shelter room. It's, so the MRVP line to get these families into a permanent affordable uh, rental unit is key. Um, and so definitely if, if this isn't making sense to you now, that's okay. Again, go to Mass Coalition's uh, Facebook page, go to Homes for Families, go to Citizens for Adequate Housing's um, Facebook page. We also have a blog, it's called facingfamilyhomelessness.com um, that you can read up on some of this stuff. We recently posted about this MRVP issue, also the, the, um, just the, the simple cost of a market rate two bedroom. Um, the hourly wage you would need to afford that is $24 an hour. So think about that. Um, and most of the families we serve are, are single moms, 18 to 24, with one or two kids. Um, no childcare, no transportation. So th you know these things just compound on themselves, and that's why we need these legislative efforts to really change the way the system works as a whole. So, oh, here, we have a question. Great. Yeah. I just want to say that this particular college, North Shore Community College, here in Lynn, needs to be congratulated because every 
single year. There are at least 25 to 35 students who go into the State House for our Legislative Action Day, and they also meet with their state uh, legislators. So um, that you ought to be commended for that. And maybe Kelly could say when that is, because I know I, I've, um, I've heard a, a couple of questions about it, so. Yeah, so we have the Great Hall at the State House booked for Thursday, March 5th. Um, so if you have a calendar with you, um, mark it. We have pre-registration open on our website, so you can let us know that you're interested in coming. And one of the things that we like to do is to make it as easy as possible for you to participate. So we'll have lots of fact sheets and information that we'll provide in the weeks and months leading up to the event. We'll also help you set up meetings with your legislator that day. It's important for people to be in the State House, but it's even more important to have those conversations while you're there directly with your legislator and their staff. To let them know why you're there, why you care about housing and homelessness issues. Um, and the related issues at the coalition. Some of our big campaigns right now outside of the youth homelessness campaign are um, to be able to increase benefits for elders and people with disabilities through the emergency age, the elderly, disabled, and children program, to change policies so that families no longer have to first stay in a place not meant for human habitation before they access shelter. And like Corey mentioned, trying to restore the mass rental voucher program, try to get it closer to the former high mark of over $120 million. So in the year ahead, um, we're looking to raise it from $65 million to $100 million. Thank you. Hi. Um, I know that we're raising awareness on the unaccompanied youth, but um, when a youth goes to a shelter, they're fighting, well, they're battling with sleeping next to an adult, you know, very double, triple their age. And then when they fall into the LGBT uh, umbrella, they're fighting if they know, because there's a lot of um, different opinions and it's really unsafe for LGBT youth to be in a shelter. Are there any bills or anything I can be made aware of that is fighting towards this? Thank you for your question. So House Bill 135, it, when we initially filed the legislation several years ago, there were two components. One would be to fund housing and services for unaccompanied youth, and the second part was to establish a special state commission on youth homelessness issues. And we were able to get that commission established not by passing the bill, but through the budget process. So the commission has been working for just under two years now, and there are four working groups, and one of the working groups is on LGBTQ youth homelessness issues. And as a commission, we've been working really aggressively and with the support of people like Speaker DeLeo to try to make sure that any new housing programs and all existing programs have um, resources and components um, dedicated to LGBTQ youth that are um, create safe spaces. Um, so for example, one of the new programs that is um, hopefully will come to fruition in the next um, year, there's um, through the Harvard Square Homeless Shelter, they're creating a new youth shelter in Cambridge. And um, one of the basic tenets is to make sure that it's a safe place um, and that there won't be gendered, for example, there won't be gendered bathrooms um, to make sure that staff understand it's student run and youth led, but make sure that everybody um, creates that safe space. We know that disproportionately youth homelessness affects LGBTQ youth. Um, and so making sure that mainstream services understand the needs of LGBTQ youth, but um, in particular that we have more resources. Um, so House Bill 135 has a big um, goal of making sure that the resources get to the youth that need it, especially LGBTQ youth. We've been working with the state's um, commission on LGBTQ youth as well and other providers um, on this campaign. Um, from a local perspective, the Continuum of Care, which is a, a group of, of local providers in the region, um, at least on the North Shore, uh, have been talking about this issue extensively, and, and the, the primary thing that comes up is funding. So it's definitely about getting behind these legislative actions and making sure that there's money on the table for, for some of these programs to move forward. A lot of agencies are aware of the issue and, and definitely are geared up to do something about it. Um, we just we need to fight for the funds.
Thank you. That concludes our um, 33rd Forum on Tolerance. Thank you all for coming today despite the weather. I want to especially thank a very special person for allowing me to co-chair this with her, Lori Carlson. It's been an honor and, and I'm so grateful for this um, opportunity. So greatly appreciate it. And being on the committee, I'm considered, well, I consider myself an outsider of North Shore Community College because I don't really go to school here. I'm not a faculty member, but I attended a forum a few years ago on autism. And afterwards, I came up to Sheldon and said, I think I'm interested in joining your committee. And he said, sure, we welcome you. So that's uh, how I got started working with this. And I gr greatly appreciate that opportunity to join this wonderful committee. So our next forum will be in the spring. And it's April 24th. And it's going to be on the power of forgiveness. And it'll, it's going to be um, a nighttime forum this time. And it'll be from 7 to 9.30 right here in the and the gymnasium. So you'll be hearing more about it as it gets closer. Um, again, thank you all to the resource tables. You guys are awesome. Thank you, thank you. It's all about resources and networking. So I greatly appreciate you doing that. So thank you. So have a great day. Be careful out there. <laughs>